I, I, I do want to say that I agree that there's uh, subsidies that uh, mask the cost, the true cost of these carbon fuels, but it's not entirely accurate to say that renewables aren't subsidized. The state has a very uh, aggressive uh, renewable energy fund that it, it raids consistently for other purposes. But we, we subsidize solar installations to the tune of about $3,000 per household until the money runs out and further subsidize them by paying the uh, owner of uh, solar units on their roof that full 20 cent retail cost when they put energy back into the grid, not just the 10 cent energy charge. So that is a form of subsidy as well. That's not a subsidy, that's an incentive. A, a subsidy is a government program or a cash outlay that lowers the price of a commodity. An incentive is a government program that facilitates the change of behavior and, and market choices. Since solar has started in 2009, the price of solar has reduced by 50%. That is as a result of an incentive, which has created market transformation. If we removed all subsidies and all incentives, renewable energy would be cheaper. And, th and that's just a fact. Um, and if, if you need to learn more about subsidies, I invite you to read the IMF report, uh, the International Monetary Fund, which is not uh, known as a left-wing green organization, has uh, calculated the global cost of fossil fuel subsidies at $5.4 trillion. That's 6.5% of global GDP is going into subsidizing fossil fuels throughout the globe. Um, I agree, these are incentives and we have them. I, and and I, I think it tries to balance the distortion in the market but, and it's true, our legislature and our governor have raided that fund or attempted to raid that fund twice. If, if we could get at a level playing field and cancel all subsidies and all incentives, there are easy ways to calculate to show that the long-term benefit of shifting to renewables is a cheaper economic uh, uh, opportunity. Okay. All right. Um, so, here's another question. Um, on August 3rd, uh, 2015, President Obama and the EPA announced the Clean Power Plan, an important step in reducing carbon pollution from power plants. It will be fully in place by 2030, less than 15 years from now. Why continue to force these natural gas pipelines and compressor stations into our communities? Why not invest your money in solar and wind now? Why not use all the land parcels to use solar farms? I'll take the uh, first uh, stab at that. So, ISO New England is the most independent agency in New England. They don't get any more independent than that. And they, they spell out the challenges with all forms of energy. One of the challenges you have with, with uh, these projects, for instance, I think the statistic is 42% of the proposed projects in 2015, submitted in January of this year, were wind. 57% were gas fire, and 1% was anything besides that. The challenge with these projects, they don't all go forward. They're just proposed. And the majority of all wind-fired projects are where the, it blows the most. That's up in the northern part of your states. And when you put a wind farm in the northern part of your state, you gotta build a transmission line to it. So that's one of the challenges. That's why Canadian Hydro is gaining more traction because they think they can bring in a large quantity of megawatts. I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. Vermont Yankee nuclear facility is like a 600, I don't know, 35 megawatt facility. To replace that with a wind farm for 635 megawatts, and a wind farm's not gonna run 24 hours a day basically like a nuclear facility can do, because the wind doesn't always blow. But to replace that is a, roughly 55,000 acres of surface land. So 55,000 acres of farmers and landowners have to have wind farms. Not saying it can't be done. In fact, the power line's already there with serving for my Yankee. But I get there. I'm, I'm talking to power developers that want to replace that with gas fire. I'm talking to a, a power generation developer in Amherst. They never get built. Merrimack is a coal fired facility. The most cost effective replace large facilities are either large scale renewables or gas fire. It's just, it's economics. They, they, it's just very, that's where we're at today. You can't just go out and replace 635 megawatts with us solar panels. 
So now, now I'll show you why nobody likes me. Um, I don't. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't. I don't think the solar industry needs full retail net metering. Uh, net meter. Let me tell you what net metering is. If you don't already know. Uh, net metering is, if you, if you have a solar array, you own generate during the day when you're not in your house and the sun is shining and you get a credit on your bill. And at night when the solar array isn't working, you pull energy off the grid. And in, in a full retail net metering scenario, you get the full credit for that. And the argument from the utilities and others is that shifts costs to other people. There's some validity to that argument, not obviously to the extent that they feel that it is. The, the transmission that's needed to move that electron to the next person that's gonna buy it is about 100 feet. Uh, you know, so that's the proportional share of the distribution charge that the utility can collect, and they collect the full retail rate. Even at a reduced rate, the economics work on a solar array. So I'm, I'm happy to have a discussion uh, with the utilities about lowering that to a point that they think it, it makes sense, as long as we study the externalities and include those costs as well, and we start having this discussion. So, you know, I don't want to seem like I'm being harsh about that, but it's, you know, it, it, the solar industry is populated by businesses, and they're trying to maximize their returns. So they want the full retail rate. It, you don't need it. So there's a way to do that. Once that, you know, issue is resolved and we get rid of this cap, I would be happy to put solar panels on every roof in this state, and it should be done. Um, and, and we can adapt to that with storage, we can adapt to it with two-way grids, there's ways we can get about it. But we're, we're not doing that because we have this arbitrary regulatory cap at 1%. That, that's what's causing the problem right now. Lower the rate, open the doors, let's get it done. Um, the, the issue of wind, um, I hate to break it to you, but nobody is going to invest money in the state of New Hampshire to put wind in. Um, Antrim is trying for the third and final time. If that project gets rejected, we will not have wind for a very long time. Iberdrola pulled up and left after the, the, the denial, the second denial of Antrim uh, for aesthetic reasons. So, you know, we've got to make a choice and, and we've got to have a plan, I mean, God forbid, that we decide where wind is going to go, get these issues fleshed out, and get it through a, a reasonable permitting process that allows us to deploy the resource or the infrastructure to capture the resource. If we don't do that, we're not going to have wind in the state. And right now, you better be watching this Antrim Wind Project because if it doesn't go through, that's going to be the end of wind in New Hampshire. Um, so, you know, all these choices are not isolated, independent choices that have no impact. They're all webbed together, and we all have to think about this. And I think really the breakdown is with a lack of leadership and a lack of planning uh, from a holistic uh, perception. And, th and that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, so there. Thank you. I think a, a holistic uh, regional plan that identifies appropriate corridors for industrial scale wind projects as a a path towards more renewables is a wonderful idea to everybody except those who live in the path of the industrial wind project. And that is what we're going to encounter with everything that is proposed. Okay, um, here's a question uh, specifically for Curtis. Uh, can you explain how the build out of natural gas pipelines would not work against the regional greenhouse gas initiative and clean power plan targets? One provision in these plans states that natural gas combined cycle generation could only increase 22% by 2022 over existing and planned gas generation as of uh, 2012. If New England generates 50% of its electricity with 1 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas, that would mean the maximum amount of natural gas we could use by 2022 is 61%, or one, um, is 1.22 uh, billion cubic feet per day. You all following this? We know who wrote this question. Um, your pipeline proposal alone would carry the natural gas total well above that number. How is your pipeline proposal conducive to the energy policies we already have in place here in New England? And then could the other panelists please weigh in as well after Mr. Cole has finished his answer? I admittedly uh, didn't follow that, but I think I got the gist. Uh, I'm going to do my best and you can correct me if I, I didn't. I didn't understand it. Let me clear up one um, misconception that folks have about our, our project. At one point, we said in our pre-filing, and keep in mind, we've been out there for 12 months in the pre-filing process. We've 6,800 uh, individuals have attended our, our town uh, 
68 um, town meetings, 28 FERC scoping meetings, a whole host of meetings. And during that process, we had said we might file for a, either, either a 30-inch 1.3 BCF a day project or a 36-inch 2.2 BCF a day project. And actually, people said, oh my goodness, they're going to export that to Europe. We didn't want to be accused of coming in later and if that number, if the, the demand for the space in our pipe exceeded our expectations. So we said we'll do either or. This summer, we identified that we don't have market above 1.3 BCF a day. So we scrapped that whole idea and we filed with FERC accordingly and said we are not even going to consider 36 inch. Now here's the deal. We don't build on speculation. Unless we have a long-term contract with a creditworthy entity, you're not our customer. And we don't, we can't, the FERC doesn't allow us to build for fun. We have to have contracts. We have 550,000 a day of contracts. So on November 20th, you're gonna see a filing that says up to 1.3 BCF a day, and oh, by the way, we'll match the amount of compression we install to match our market over time. Now here's the thing, we're putting in a 30 inch pipe we control how much capacity is on that pipe by the amount of horsepower that we install at each one of these compressor stations. A compressor station might only have one turbine instead of two. We're not going to put in free capacity and let people just have it available to serve them. We will serve our customers. So we're not going to overbuild our project. That's just not going to happen. FERC doesn't even allow you to do that. You've got you to demonstrate convenience and necessity and need. FERC, we're regulated by FERC. And that's how we operate. So we file for 1.3. The final installation we based on, the amount of compression we based on our market, our demonstrated market. And I assure you, each and every one of our, all of our customers on NED market and NED supply are listed, unless it's subject due to confidentiality agreement, and they, their exact quantity that they contracted for. And so this will all be laid out for you. And with, I hope I answered the question. If I understand the question correctly, it seems to be aimed at uh, if we have this pipe, new pipeline built and all this natural gas, additional natural gas comes in and is burned, won't that uh, put us in trouble with the clean power plant? Um, actually, uh, the uh, alternative, uh, since in the absence of this natural gas, we are not going to, in the next five to 10 years, miraculously see enough wind turbines and solar panels to uh, generate the 38,000 megawatts of electricity that New England needs. So if we are not getting it from natural gas, and I'm take, not taking any position on the pipeline in this regard, but what experience of the past three years has shown us, suggesting what the next five to 10 years would look like, if they don't have natural gas to go to, they're gonna burn coal and oil, and that's really gonna put us in trouble with the clean power plan. Uh, so, we, yeah, energy efficiency, renewables, wonderful by 2030. It's not gonna happen. It, the, tech, it, the technology, it, the, the political will, the needed investment, uh, the completely complete restructuring of the grid that's gonna be necessary to uh, enable us to keep the lights on uh, with renewables and reduce our demand to the extent that renewables will be adequate is, is at least 10 or 20 years down the road. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't it have to be? Uh, well, if, if someone knows how to make it happen faster, that's a great uh, thesis. Say no now and let the politicians be on the yeah, that's that's where I was going to go with this. I don't I don't think that our regulatory or legal structure is structured to allow us to to free the innovation that we have capable to do it. Um, you, you I would invite you to learn more about Green Mountain Power in Vermont, uh, a utility company that's a B Corp. Uh, they're no longer uh, investment you know owned the the way we traditionally think of utilities, and the, um, they are fully. Uh, on board with meeting Vermont's 90% renewable by 2050 goal. And that's, that's, that's the utility. Uh, the, the CEO is, is a woman who, uh, before she would take over, uh, she came into the office building and removed all the walls and said, this is, we're gonna run this company like a startup. 
and uh, there are no walls in Green Mountain Power's building. I haven't seen it yet, but I believe her. Um, they've installed a, you know, a significant microgrid project in Rutland. They're trying to make Rutland uh, the renewable energy city of the, of the country, um, and it's all being driven by the utility. Uh, we don't even have the capacity to allow our utilities to do that in this state. Would they? Probably. Um, there are people out there that are looking at Green Mountain Power and thinking that this is new. This is the new utility and the way to do it. And um, but we don't. We don't do that. So I, I believe the technology is there. I, I believe that private and there's trillions of dollars sitting on the sideline waiting to invest in this stuff. And there's just not a conduit to allow it to happen. We have an unstable or unstable policy in this state. We try to raid the Renewable Energy Fund. We try and repeal REGI. We try and repeal our renewable portfolio standard. I spend half my time in Concord trying to get them to not do stupid things, let alone trying to tell them to do smart things. And so, it, it's a, so easy to beat on Concord, isn't it? <laughs> but it's true, it is true. And, and you know, private capital does not sit around and go, boy, it looks really risky in New Hampshire. Let's flood it with money. That's not how it works. And so, you know, our leadership has to stand up and say, if we want to really put our money where our mouth is, we've got to create a stable conduit uh, that shows that we reward people with creativity. We understand that there's risk, but we're going to take away the political risk. And right now, you know, it's going to be a couple of years before we can get it back. Even if we pass the most progressive, comprehensive energy policy act in New Hampshire, it's going to be two years before people say, eh, well, let's see what happens next year or next year. And then that's what we're going to have. And so I urge you to be cognizant of this instability that we seem to have in Concord, particularly as it relates to energy policy. I never like to blow a question. I didn't understand the question really well. So I'm going to quote you some statistics from the ISO New England, and hopefully it'll be a little bit better. The ISO New England said since 2000, uh, let's see here. They stated that as a result of New England's transition from coal and oil to natural gas from 2001 to 2013, regional emissions of carbon dioxide fell by 23%, NOx by 66%, and regional emissions of sulfur dioxide fell by 91%. Continued reliance on oil, coal and oil will impact the region's effort to meet new carbon emission standards set by the EPA's recently released Clean Power Plan. The increasing gas supply in the region and siting gas transmission facilities in areas without access to gas supply increases the opportunity for expansion of natural gas distribution service and conversion from oil to gas for home heating. A typical home New England household heating with oil can cut its carbon dioxide emissions by more than 50% by switching to natural gas. Hopefully that answers a little bit better. From carbon dioxide to methane? Those are the uh, fracking uh, consequences, no question about it. Um, I do think it's interesting that even in the most uh, 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 aggressive scenario in a very uh, uh, you know, strong environment like Vermont, they're still looking at, at 2050. So we still got a good 30 years to bridge. Uh, before we are the uh, almost all renewable society. Uh, and I think that was the theme of the evening, is, is natural gas a rational bridge? Uh, and uh, really, it is. Uh, there is, it's the best bridge, because it's, it's the lowest uh, polluting of the fossil fuels. And so, uh, whether this, which pipeline is, uh, is acceptable, which pipeline presents the lowest cost uh, versus benefit, uh, is at the heart of the debate that's now uh, in play. So I think uh, we're past our time, but there's one question that um, we haven't really even touched, I don't think, um, and that's about um, energy efficiency. Um, so one question is, uh, what percentage of our energy needs do you think could be addressed through demand reduction, energy efficiency, time of use, et cetera? So then anyone want to take a crack at that? So there's a docket at the PUC for, uh, the PUC is the Public Utilities Commission, which regulates all utilities in the state of New Hampshire. There's a docket for the energy efficiency resource standard, which is basically a, a mandate to the utilities to meet a certain amount of their, their, their load by energy efficiency. And I'm gonna screw this up, but uh, it's something like 9% cumulative in 10 years. Um, I, I think 
I think we can meet more. Uh, I think it's been studied over and over again, and we can meet it by a lot more. Um, but again, that 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 efficiency issue needs to be placed back into the context of we can't compensate our utilities on selling power as their mechanism for making money and then turn around and make them be efficient. We have to, here's the term for tonight, decouple, decoupling. We have to decouple the profit of utilities from the volumetric sale of energy. They, they should make their profit for providing us a service, not for, for providing us a, a, a significant number of kilowatt hours. Then you can reward a utility for reaching efficiency, and the utility can make even more money uh, by itself becoming more efficient. So I, I think that because we don't have enough laboratories in the country showing effective decoupling and the linking between this reward for efficiency, I, I don't even know if we know exactly how much we can reach uh, by efficiency. But, but that, that regulatory structure needs to be cracked and re rebuilt in a way that allows us to reward our utilities rather than penalize them uh, for uh, uh, implementing efficiency programs. So we are at our appointed time to finish. I, I don't know if any of the panelists would be, um, I'm sorry. Just, but. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't, I don't know anything about energy efficiency, so I rely on ISO New England. They have a regional electricity outlook. They publish it, it's on their website. Here's what they quote. By 2022, New England states, New England state goal, states goals for energy efficiency and renewable resources will equal an estimated one third of the region's projected electricity energy consumption. And they go on to decide how all six states are ranked in the top 25 by the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy with four of the six states in the top 10. You have a lot to be proud of and, and keep that up. Uh, but this is just from ISO New England, uh, one third by 2022. So I want to thank everyone for coming, and especially for our panelists. Um, I especially, um, I, I mean, what, what came across to me um, was uh, Clay's comments about we've got a broken system. Um, and I think all of us have just gotten shaken up with these proposals and the other proposals that, like wind farms that people have um, opposed as well. We've got a broken system, we're lacking leadership, um, and Clay's other comment, you know, we have a lack of planning. So hopefully we can all kind of work towards a more functional system. Um, and I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions, um, but um, perhaps the panelists would be willing to hang around for a few minutes and answer some questions, I don't know. Um, but um, I'd like to um, give a round of applause to our panelists for um, coming. And thanks to all of you who wrote questions. I'm sorry I didn't get um, to all of them, so thank you.